a lot with uh, Get Rid of Columbus Day and everything else, which we have a book on there and, and switching it. He was really idolized in this period as the guy that is the explorer wedding, willing to take the risk and go to the new country. New York put that statue up in 1892 to honor that. There was talk that Mayor de Blasio wanted to take it down. Okay. You can see another angle of it here. <coughs> Yellow fever. So this is 1891, uh, the lynching. 1892, yellow fever goes crazy. Mother Cabrini is sent to New Orleans, and she, uh, Barbara Cotto's, in, in a right diagonal across from Jean Lafitte Bar, was where she uh, was sent. She gets an orphanage going. The orphanage is to handle all the amount of kids that are orphans from their parents dying of yellow fever. The orphanage also, she asked Salvador Pizzotti, who had made a lot of money in oranges, to fund him, fund building a better orphanage. She gets $75,000 from Captain Pizzotti, who has no kids. That becomes Cabrini High School. That's on Esplanade. And a, a side note there with Pizzotti as well is that Paul Harris was working at the next year, 1893. Paul Harris is working for Pizzotti's orange plantations in, in Buras. A hurricane comes by that's like one of the top five worst hurricanes in American history. Cominataville, it hill, kills 500 Sicilians. The Sicilians had left New Orleans because there was just, you know, just not a good place to be. So they're down there and they get hit with a hurricane. Paul Harris had come down from Chicago. He was in law school. He's taking some time. He's writing for the papers here. He loses his job. He goes down there to pick oranges to just have a job. He ends up saving a lot of lives. Ten years later, Paul Harris founds Rotary Club. So Rotary Club has its roots in Buras, Louisiana. Pizzotti Plantation, or, or, or Orange uh, Farm. A lot of them move up to Donaldsonville. You can see in this grave here, they've got the Italian flag colors. Donaldsonville has a tremendous population uh, from the, the era working on the plantations where the, the Italians came up to cut sugar cane and, took the, and did those jobs. They now have, this was last year in October, they have a spaghetti fest, which we're starting to see more and more of these in our Italian communities. Uh, it's, it's going quite well. Uh, and they, they have just an amazing amount of, of heritage in Donaldsonville, of Italian heritage. The, I don't know if you know the Russo brothers, if you've heard of them, you, you've probably heard of the Marvel movie series and Captain America, um, which was the top grossing for a little bit at 6.2 billion last year. It's done by the Russo brothers and they trace their heritage to Donaldsonville. So now we'll take over Hollywood too, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> this is, shows the path of that hurricane, how it came up, it hit here and went out to sea there. It, the, the records is it likes pushing a 14 to 20 foot uh, surge and people were just sitting talking they had no advance notice they just basically killed them there's a great uh, museum in Galliano that showcases the, the whole story there and how they started relocating from town to town to find safety in other places so here's the, the story I just told you like I said five deadliest hurricanes in US history it's listed right here at number four there's a marker there down there by Burris talking about Paul Harris and how he went on the found Rotary Club after saving lives in Buras. This is again, I, we earlier I, I did jump ahead. This is the Mother Cabrini and the Salvador Pizzotti story. This is pictures of the orphanage. I don't know if that's Captain Pizzotti here. There is, oddly enough, you, you might think this is um, Mary. On Harrison Avenue and Canal is this statue. It is actually Mother Cabrini. So if you're down in Lakeview area of New Orleans, you'll see that statue and it's, there's a Knights of Columbus stand behind it, but it's Mother Cabrini. She opened up 67 facilities and she was 67 years old when she passed away. We're now moving on 1890s. We have the pasta factory start going. This is across from Jackson Square. This is Muriel's restaurant now. 11 pasta factories opened in the French Quarter of New Orleans. It was called the Spaghetti District at one point. And the reason why is that the Dingley Tariff, 1897, so Sicilians come in, Americans start to fall in love with spaghetti. All right, and, and we see tariff issues today. So they decided, America decided we don't want all this importing pasta coming in. So they put a tariff on importing Italian pasta. 
result was 11 pasta companies opened up in the French Quarter. They got their machines, they started making their own pastas. Terramina was one of them. Another one was the Cusimano pasta factory. I think I have that one in here. This is the Cusimano pasta factory, which is now the Hotel Richelieu. This is the bar, it's a great place. It's in, that, it's in the uh, Esplanade area of the French Quarter. Uh, it's a great, great bar to have to hang out in. You just see the stuff there. So they were making 10,000 pounds of pasta a day at this Cusimano pasta factory. And when other people got in trouble, he was funding them. He was like a venture capitalist. So out of this man Cusimano, he funds the guy that starts Progresso Soups. Okay, and the guy started, he was broke. And then he lost his job, and he started, they started, gave him a few dollars, and he started getting old cans. And him and his wife, they said she would use her apron to wipe the cans, and they would go put them back in stores. It was the Udo family. And from that, they, they started Progresso Soups. Wow. Great success story in what they did. And then also, Luxury Pasta. It's how it comes out of New Orleans as well during this era. And again, it's funded by Cusimano, who funds this guy to get, he's like a VC. Very ha happy to help others have uh, success. Uh, this is something that most people don't know about, but it's coming back as, as, as being interesting and, and noteworthy. During the 1915 era, I talked about Nick LaRocca and, and Pete Colotta and, and Pete Herman as well. The jazz man story gets going. The jazz man is killing Italian grocery store owners. And the deal was, he actually sends out a note one night, uh, post a letter that says, if you're playing jazz, I will pass over your house. There were eight Italian grocery store owners, I, I believe it might be off of one or two, that were murdered during this period. They never actually have solved this case. However, this one woman who's lost her husband, who was killed, he was actually going in the house and taking their own axe and killing them, not just robbing them or anything. He would go through the back door, get, up, get into the house, and, and kill these grocery store owners. And there are some around Carrollton. There's one on the, in Algiers area, and there's a couple towards the Bywater. So he kills this one husband, but then later, he, this woman goes to California, and this guy's trying to break in her house, and she shoots and kills him. And he was from New Orleans, and then the Axe Man story goes away. So that, that a lot of people think that might be the person, that, his name was Mumphrey, that was the, that was the Axe Man. Okay, big thing here is muffaladas. And this, is, this has been a lot of fun because you, when I, you can see here the original muffalada. This is at, at, at Central Grocery. If you go a couple of doors down, Frank's has, says the original muffalada. I go to Monroe, my grandfather's restaurant. He says the original muffalada in Monroe. I mean, everybody wants to be the original muffalada. I talked to, to this guy out at, that has two Tony's restaurant, his great friend. He tells me that it was originally the Romano, and that they were the ones that started it. And then I have another good friend named Lanassa, and he says, no, no, it was my great, great aunt, because her name was Mufalada. She made the bread, she married Lanassa, and the name got lost. And that's his version of it. So it just makes for great conversation, but it's a great sandwich. And then now we have a Mufalada festival out in Metairie every year. The, uh, this, the slide might be out of place here, actually. Um, well, actually, no, this is, this is why this is here. <coughs> Lynching was just not in New Orleans. This is outside of Monroe, a town called Tallulah. That, there was an era there of lynching, and it went into the 1930s, where Sicilians and Italians were being lynched across Louisiana. And then I just told you my friend Lanassa, if you go down to Cater Street, you will see this building. And if you look up at the top, it says Anthony Lanassa on it. It was a Lanassa hardware store for a while. There were seven Lanassa brothers that had almost that had the whole block of Decatur Street for a period. What, what block? I think the 1400. Okay. It's, um, it's right across from uh, the French Market. There's a, a, a bar cafe there. Mm -hmm. This is now the uh, Santa Claus shop. Oh, okay. Okay. And this story, I mean, amazing stories I heard. My good friend Ronnie, his dad became a doctor, and this was. Uh, the, when the dad was, was, had, was too busy, because they had four of them, Ronnie was the oldest, they would drop him off at Lanassa Hardware to work, just to have something, you know, get him out the house. 
and he, he did fish hooks. So this these place here supplied fishing nets and everything to St. Bernard Parish. The guys would come in and this is where they typically got their fishing supplies. And then there was another guy, Uncle Mike, had a restaurant there as well. And uh, it's funny, he, Ronnie tells me that Uncle Mike always had a lot of cash on him. And all the other, his grandparents would say, you don't hang around with Uncle Mike at all. Because mm -hmm. Uncle Mike apparently had a restaurant on floor one, gambling on floor two, and a brothel on floor three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this, this area then, it, so now we're really covering it through about 1950, we see that there's a large Italian population in the French Quarter. But, but what happened was things change, and this is actually a, maybe a little bit out of, this is definitely out of place, but we'll go back. Uh, this is the George Schmidt, the gallery just closed on Julia Street, did this painting. And this is Pete Herman, the boxer, Pete Galata, and this is Nick LaRocca playing jazz. So this is a recreation of that scene from that era. And this is what it looks like today. On Canal Street right there at St. At, uh, St. Charles and Royal. Louis Prima we talked about in the music. And this is the marker that we just put up. His exhibit will be open for about another year at the Jazz Museum. But it's not permanent. So if you want to see it, it's a great exhibit. It's been here a year. It was only supposed to be here a year. I think they're going to extend it two years. Coming up now, we started seeing this era of 1930s Italian still weren't. No. Uh, Italians still weren't part of accepted into the culture. So they formed their own mm -hmm. things. The Elanians, the Virgilians were a Mardi Gras crew that had balls. The Elanians, still very active. It was a way for debutantes, Italian debutantes to come to be presented. They're having a, a, doing a lot with our bocce club coming up. And the Italian hall was on Esplanade. It's been sold in its condos now, but it's, ne it's, across, it's right ac almost across the street from a place called Buffus? Buffus. Buffus. And you can see the lions are still there, and there's just a plaque there that at home. When World War II starts, we see the internment camps. There were almost 2,000 Italians put in internment camps during World War II. So we had many people who were actually fighting, as I had great uncles that fought in World War II, but a lot of them, actually here in New Orleans, were put into camps. And, and, and it was really kind of chaos about what happened with the Italians during that period. During that period, because of this problem, because we were, they actually, America's at war with Italy, the clubs changed their names. This was a club that was in Monroe, and it was actually called the Italian Beneficial Society. It had to change its name to the Progressive Men's Club. They were trying to assimilate quickly into the club. The Beauregard Kai's house uh, was a, was a, is in, or across from St. Mary's. It's a place where a, a, a family that put an end to the black hand was. There was a mass killing there. This guy, these, these group guys showed up demanding this wine merchant pay them money, extortion. And he said, I'll pay you. And he went out to the room, came back with a shotgun and killed him sitting at his dinner table. The uh, St. Mary's is right across the street from that. And St. Mary's was closed. It used to be a parish with a church. That led to a lot of the Italians leaving the quarter. One of my favorites here, Victor Scarrow becomes mayor in 1960s. And to me, he gets a lot of credit for a lot of things. You go out to California, you got Disneyland, Disney World. New Orleans has a part in there. Victor was the guy that did that. The Saints come to town. We have NASA come, opens up uh, to build the Apollo rocket in New Orleans. The Mardi Gras clubs of Endymion and Bacchus get started during his era. The Superdome is, gets funded to take the land away. The bonds get passed. So we see that he did a lot of stuff during his time as mayor. He was the second Italian mayor in the city, the first one being May Street. 